how much trust there is between people who have never met each other with who will never meet each other again and so on. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. Today on Point, we're launching a special series we're calling Essential Trust. What trust is, why it's important, and what happens when it's lost. Stay with us. Live from NPR News in Washington. Roanoke City Council regular session for September the 19th, 2022 is hereby called to order and I will ask our clerk, Ms. Susan McCord, to please call the roll. Mr. Best Pitch? Here. Mr. Cobb? Here. Ms. Moon Reynolds? Here. Ms. Price? Here. Ms. Sanchez Jones? Here. Vice Mayor White Boyd? Here. And Mayor Lee? Here. And a quorum is present. Uh, this evening, our invocation will be delivered uh, by uh, Elder James L. Ham, Jr., an associate minister of God and the Prayer Number no. 7. And following his uh, invocation, I will lead you in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, come on up. Elder Ham, good to see you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity, Mayor Lee and Council. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to assemble ourselves here today. Lord, we thank you for this council, Mayor Lee, Vice Mayor um, White Boy, and all the council members. Lord, we're asking you to bless this city, God, as they approach to do the work for you, God. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you for it all. And God, we're asking you to continue to look upon our city, God. Heal our city, God, which only that you can do. Lord, we'll forever give your name the praise. All the glory it belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Ham. All right, welcome everybody to our second session of today. And okay, if there's some seats up front here. Uh, uh, and I got my friends who are pastors here, they seated like every seats fill up before the front seats fill up. So y'all can come on up here if you run out of space. All right, uh, the first thing on our agenda tonight is we're going to certify a closed meeting, so I'm going to call on council members to make a motion, and uh, we'll second that. 
I move with respect to any closed meeting just concluded that each member of city council in attendance certify to the best of his or her knowledge that one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in any motion by which any closed meeting was convened, were heard, discussed, or considered by the members in council in attendance. Ms. Tucker. Second. Thank you. Madam Clerk, you call the roll. Mr. Bestpitch. Aye. Mr. Cobb. Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds. Aye. Ms. Price. Aye. Ms. Sanchez Jones. Aye. Vice Mayor White Boyd Aye. and Mayor Lee. Ah, and thank you. Thank you all. Council meetings are televised live and replayed on RVTV Channel 3 on Thursdays at 7 o'clock p.m. and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. and video streamed through Facebook Live at facebook.com slash Roanoke VA. Council meetings are offered with closed captioning for the deaf or hard of hearing. All right, our first item on our agenda tonight is a public hearing. And public hearing A1 is a request of the Virginia Transformer Corporation to rezone property located at 207 Berkeley Road Northwest from residential single family district to light industrial district with the spokesperson, Mary Ellen Goodlatte is the spokesperson for this. There's one measure. Move the measure. Second. Madam Clerk, can you please read the title paragraph? An ordinance to rezone certain property located at 207 Berkeley Road Northeast, official tax map number 7050101 from R5 Residential Single Family District to I1 Light Industrial District, sub subject to certain conditions proffered by the applicant and dispensing with the second reading of this ordinance by title. Thank you. Uh, it must be noted that the City Planning Commission recommends approval of this item. And I'm pleased to recognize Ms. Goodlatte for any comments she may want to have or if she just wants to answer any questions we have. We're real happy to answer any questions that members of council may have. Kevin Lowry of Virginia Transformer is with me. We're pleased that the Planning Commission has recommended approval to council. Thank you. All right, I'm going to now open the public hearing and uh, I'm going to call on, are there any citizens signed up to be to speak on this issue? Yes, sir. We have one citizen. Okay. That is Chris Kraft. Right. Good evening, Ms. Kraft. Good evening, Mayor Lee, members of council. As president of the Wildwood Civic League, I know you've, I've came before y'all a few times about problems with communication between the city and the neighborhoods. Well, this the Virginia Transformer ranks high on my list of great people. They did it the right way. They contacted the Neighborhood Association before they filed anything, which shows that they really care for the neighborhood that they're in. Virginia Transformer is located in the Wildwood neighborhood. It's 50 year history here in Roanoke. Just picture that 50 years here in Roanoke. Their home corporate office is right here in Roanoke, north of my neighborhood. Virginia Transformer is producing small transformers to become and is the largest United States based power transformer in America. They have 50 years, let's see, 1,500 person team, five plants in North America, and its customers include Tesla, Chevron, Duke Energy, Edison International, and Siemens. I am proud that they're calling Roanoke their home. And to want to expand in my neighborhood instead of moving, because they started in my neighborhood on another side of Orange Avenue. And I'm, we're asking that the city please approve this 
let them do it because they are great business partners with the city and with my neighborhood. And I look forward to many more requests where they can add more jobs. He told me they had like two or 300 people start today up there. So that means it's more people working. That means more jobs in our city, more people spending money in my neighborhood in the city. And that's what we need, more people to get to work and make, spend their money here in the city. And I just ask, we just ask that y'all approve it and let us go. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Craft. Uh, there are no other speakers? No, Madam sir. Craft? Okay, with that being said, then uh, we're going to close the public hearing. And I'll ask my colleagues on city council if they have any comments or discussions or questions. Mr. Best page. Well, I'll just make a comment on, on part of the narrative that was provided to us uh, along with this application just to make sure everybody understands that uh, Virginia Transformer Corporation is actually an international company. It's headquartered here in Roanoke, but they have four other locations in North America and four more locations in other countries around the world. They want to add 100 employees. They want to do it in Roanoke, but they don't have the space. But they have at least eight other options that they could go to. So I appreciate the fact that they want to continue to grow and stay here in Roanoke, and I hope that everybody will support this rezoning. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, uh, Council McCall. Well, I, I echo everything that Mr. Bestpitch said. They're a fantastic company, and you know they've worked really hard to be creative, not only during the pandemic, but uh, emerging from the pandemic, and they're leading the way with uh, building EV electric vehicle chargers. So I, I really commend their leadership on that. Thank you. All right. Uh, there are no other comments. I'll ask the clerk to call a roll on this matter. I think Ms. Sanchez Jones has a You all have to, let me, let me say something here on this. <laughs> call out Mr. Mayor or mayor or chairman for that matter. <laughs> Let me know. You can't whisper this to yourself. And I'm looking. Nothing's happening. That's all. Just say, Mr. Mayor, hold up. I got you. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. Mr. Ms. Sanchez Jones. Okay. <laughs> I just, I just want to thank Virginia Transformer to try to find that they fought hard to find a solution for their employee parking because it's really hard to go into your job and not find a place to park in the mornings. And also for their expansion. So. Thank you. Right. Anybody? Thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments? Okay. Well, since we're commenting, Mayor, I will just say that they are uh, in uh, they are uh, in uh, in lockstep with the 2040 plan and the Hollands and the Wildwood area, and they are consistent with that plan. So I'll just add that since we're commenting, but we were ready to vote. All right, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll. Yes, sir. Mr. Bespitch. Aye. Mr. Cobb, Ms. Moon Reynolds, Aye. Ms. Price, Ms. Sanchez Jones, Aye. Vice Mayor White Boyd, Aye. and Mayor Lee. Aye. And uh, the public hearing uh, is approved. Ms. Goodlatte, thank, thank you. Okay. All right, item number two is a request of trustees of High Street Baptist Church to rezone an approximately 12,054 square foot portion of property located at 1433 Lafayette Boulevard, Northwest, from Institutional Plan Unit Development District to Residential Mixed Density District. Wallace I. Allen is the chair, the real estate department spokesperson. There is an ordinance. Move the ordinance. Second. All right, Madam okay. Clerk, can you please uh, read the. Mr. Mayor. Oh, yeah, I think she got it. Mr. Mayor. I have a statement. <laughs> of right. course you do. Thank you. Ma I try to speak up okay. loudly. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir, just a moment. I, Anita James Price, state that I have a personal interest in this agenda item at the 7 o'clock council meeting on September 19, 2022 
regarding the request of High Street Baptist Church to rezone a portion of its property located at 1433 Lafayette Boulevard Northwest from industrial plan unit development to residential mixed density district because I attend High Street Baptist Church and have served on the committee that filed the, the application to rezone this property. Therefore, pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3112, I will refrain from participation in this matter, and I ask that the city clerk accept the statement and ask that it be made a part of the minutes of this meeting. All right. Thank you. Allen uh, is the chair of the real estate department, is a spokesperson. Uh, there's one measure. Move the ordinance. Second. All right, Madam Clerk, please read the title paragraph. An ordinance to rezone certain property located at 1433 Lafayette Boulevard Northwest, a portion of official tax map number 2450422 from INPUD Institutional Plan Unit Development District to RM-1 Residential Mixed Density District and dispensing with the second reading of this ordinance by title. Thank you. Must be noted that the City Planning Commission recommends approval of this item. And at this time, I'm going to recognize Mr. Allen for any comments that he have, or he can just answer any questions that the council may have. Mayor Lee, Vice Mayor, White Board, and members of council, I would be pleased to answer any questions that you would have about this matter. All right. Well, thank you. We're going to go through and we'll just hold your spot there and we'll see what questions we have. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm going to open the public hearing now. And I'm going to ask our clerk, are there any citizens signed up to be heard on this matter? I do not have anyone signed up. Okay. All right, there are no citizens signed up uh, to be heard, so therefore I will close the public hearing and go to comments by members of council. All right, and I'm going to recognize the vice mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to commend High Street for uh, proposing multi-family dwelling because we are so short of housing that this would be a blessing for that community and I will also add that is consistent with the city's 2040 plan and the Melrose Rugby neighborhood plan so thank you for doing that you're going to satisfy a huge need in our community so this is a blessing to us thank you thank you mr. mayor thank you there ain't no other comments by the council. Madam Clerk, I'm gonna ask you to please call the roll. Mr. Bestpitch? Aye. Mr. Cobb? Aye. Ms. Moon Reynolds? Aye. Ms. Price? <clears throat> She's that's right, she's recused herself. Um, Ms. Sanchez Jones? Aye. Vice Mayor Vice Mayor White Boyd. Aye. And Mayor Lee. Aye. And this item passes. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Allen, thank you, and uh, congratulations to High Street. I want to see Pastor Turner there in the audience. It's good to see you. Thank you all. Thank all of you all who are here from High Street Baptist Church. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you okay. very much. All right. All right, we're now down to item B, which is the hearing of citizens upon public matters. Let me state that city council sets this time as a priority for citizens to be heard. Now, if deemed appropriate, matters will be referred to the city manager for response, recommendation, or report to the council. 
And I'm pleased to recognize Deputy City Manager Clarence Grill, who's sitting with us tonight uh, in the absence of uh, Mr. Cowell, Bob Cowell. All right, um, Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers signed to speak, people signed to speak up? Yes, we do. We have 10 speakers, and they'll have three minutes each. Okay. We have 10 speakers, and I'm going to ask that uh, you have three minutes each. Yes. Three minutes each, and I'm going to ask the clerk to call the first three. You can get in line for this thing. All right. Lisa Archer. Ronnie Wayne Blankenship and Latori Woodbury. Okay, if y'all would come down. Woodbury, was that the name we called this afternoon? This, yes, we did. <laughs> yes. He's we here did. to remember you on Woodbury. You remember? Okay. All right, give first, first, second. Um, first, Lisa Archer. Okay. I was hoping I wouldn't go first today. <laughs> um, my name is Lisa Archer. I am here as a member of the group of the Roanoke Alliance for Reproductive Rights, and we're here tonight to ask you to, for the council to uphold uh, the current rights that are in state for us. And I just want to share a personal story in regards to that matter. Um, when I think about the need to protect reproductive rights, there are a lot of moments from my own life and for those shared with me by friends. Um, but the one I chose tonight is something that, for me, cemented the understanding about why reproductive rights should be protective, protected. When I was a sophomore in college, I lived in a cooperative house with 12 students. And during the winter term, I was sexually assaulted in my bedroom on the third floor. Luckily, I was already on birth control, and I went to my local Planned Parenthood and tested negative for STIs. I didn't tell anyone for many years because I was ashamed, and I felt that by not speaking the words out loud, it would protect me, and I could pretend that it didn't happen. But then my senior year, I lived in that same house, and I held the position of house manager, which is a position where you are responsible for your housemates, and they come to you with problems, concerns, and you try and help address them. And that spring, one of my housemates, who was a dear friend, was sexually assaulted in almost the exact same manner I was, one floor below me as I slept. She also didn't want to tell anyone, and she was reluctant to go to the University Health Center because she didn't want the appointment to appear on her parents' health insurance. Luckily, we had Planned Parenthood. I helped her make an appointment. I drove her there. She wasn't pregnant. She didn't have an STI, but she did struggle to finish her final semester of school. A few months earlier, I had made an appointment at that same plant, Parenthood, for another housemate who was pregnant, very much wanted the baby, but while she was taking notes in her anthropology class, she began to bleed and miscarried. Shortly after my college graduation, I would help another housemate and friend make an appointment at that same Planned Parenthood for an abortion. She and her partner found out they were pregnant. She was a first-generation college student and had just been accepted into a prestigious PhD program across the country. Her partner was also about to start grad school in another state across the country. It was not the right time for them to have a child. That year was heavy. It was a lot for a group of 21-year-olds to deal with. Luckily, we had access to health care and lived in a state in a time and place where a right to seek that health care was protected. Now, in a little over two minutes, I've mentioned luck three times, which fills me with so much sadness and so much anger. You shouldn't need luck to ensure your health and wellness. Your government, your state government, your local government should provide that for you and protect your right to it. And that is what I and my uh, fellow members are asking tonight. Thank you for your time. Ronnie Wayne Blankenship. <laughs> I was here about 90 days ago. It was exactly 90 days ago. I'm talking to you about 502 Mapleton. People were living in the backyard there. Uh, they had mattresses in utility buildings. Uh, the cleanup has started. Uh, something, somebody has triggered that, and I'd like to thank everybody for that. Uh, 
the mattresses that were in the three utility buildings are laying in the front yard now, and it's creating kind of a stench. But there is some activity, and there has been some cleanup. I don't need to take a whole lot of time. I'd like to just pass this out if I can. Is it, is it okay to cross the stanchion? Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, sir. I think we made up more than we need. There you go. And this is just a thank you. And the neighborhood will keep watching. And I'll be back in 90 days or 1st of January if I have to. But thanks for everything. Thank you for helping us out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You have one more. Um, yes, you can. All right. Now, where are we on speaker? Okay, our next speaker is Latori Woodbury. Oh, yeah, okay. How y'all doing today? How you doing? Mr. Cobbs, Mr. Lee, Ms. Reynolds, minimums of the chemist chance uh, Sanchez. Um, I know I only have three minutes, so there's no way in the world in three minutes I could tell y'all how serious I need you guys to help and support. I know I didn't have my 501c3. We went through that journey. We do have it now. I promised some of the family members that came here with me tonight that I would come and bring this back in front of you guys. So I'm here. I know I only have three minutes, so I just kind of want to get some clarity of where we are in funding and facility for my program and just kind of let me know and the family members know where we are. That way I can give them a better understanding. We can all have a better understanding of where we move forward from here. Good. Um, I can give you a roundup of what we've been doing. Um, we've lost our facility in uh, Champs Gym. Since then we took that situation and turned it into boxing in the park. Um, We've been doing that at Booker T. Washington Park. We've uh, retained some of our kids, brought in some new kids, always having a good group, but we provided this service uh, free to the community. Um, but the only thing you have to do is sign in. So basically, you have to have your parents' permission, and you can sign in. So we've just basically been rolling, still servicing the community free of charge. Um, this is some of the pictures from that. Some of the guys. It's some of the guys. Just like I said, we run from ages of 7 to 17, so it's not just a certain demographic. On certain days, I might have 5, 6, 7, 8 year olds. Some days, I might have 15, 16, 19, 25 year olds. So we come from a different demographic. You can skip that. We can come from a, a different demographic. Hey! Um, <laughs> you could have played. Uh, I mean, you know. Um, but I, I, like I said, three minutes I couldn't tell you possibly, but we have a major impact. I don't know if you guys have been reading the newspaper, but we're in there. One of the young men is here that's in that newspaper. You know, so we are impacting lives and changing lives, and we do need assistance and help. So um, that was my three minutes, I think. Was it? It's not quite. Okay. Well, I got 15 <laughs> seconds more to promote this program. So listen, boxing saves lives. We're trying to save some here in Roanoke. We keep on having bodies drop. We keep on having people who are not equipped with conflict resolution and stress relief tension. So let's offer it more. Let's offer it more. I want, I want to get out here. I got the energy. I want to get out here and, and help. Um, I'm offering my service free right now, but it's always great to get paid. So um, if you guys can help me out anyway with that, we definitely would appreciate it. And with 20 seconds left, I'm going to just say thank you for everybody who came with me. Thank you guys for having me here. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Woodbury, can you come back up to the mic, please? Let me say we're very familiar with you. Uh, yes, sir. I am, uh, you know, we've talked and my organization 
got you all the awards, and we want you to stay because I think we believe in what you're doing and the difference that it made. So, yes, sir. Uh, with that being said, I'm gonna. I got my colleagues. Who want them to have some fun. Want to make a few statements for you. Okay. I just have a question for you, yes, and that is, are you boxing down in the park? Yes, ma'am. What are your plans going into the fall, into the winter? Uh, well, right now we're trying to attract sponsorship for a facility because with my age demographic and with the clientele that I serve, I want to do it for free. I don't feel like a kid should have to come in and pay a gym due because, you know, they can't really sign a contract for nothing else. So I feel like I want to open this up for free. I want to subsidize a facility that's safe enough for me to run out of that I can insure and just do what I love to do. I love to teach boxing. Everybody I teach boxing to loves it, so I haven't had any complaints. I've had more requests and complaints. Um, other than that, ma'am, just, I'm just anxious to get going. I don't really have big plans. I don't really have a So you don't plan. have any uh, a venue at this point? No, ma'am. I, uh, I think I proposed uh, a couple of venues uh, that there was city, there was city uh, I think it was Norwich, and um, maybe was it Preston Park? Norwich, Preston. Preston Park. That has like uh you know after school programs because overall i want to offer an after school program this year from three o'clock to seven thirty to be able to give like low income parents mm -hmm. uh, another child care option something alternative that their kids gonna take to they're not gonna get thrown out of that you know it's gonna be something a little bit more for them and uh so in norwich are you looking at the uh former rec center in norwich is, is that actually it was a storage shed i'll take okay. the storage shed okay. um you know right now i'm teaching it under a park shelter so yeah. um just wherever there's got some lights a uh, roof and uh, enough space for me to run the program mm -hmm. you know that's not going to be like any health issues or mm -hmm. you know any any other issues yeah. so other have you spoken with any of the city staff with regards to those two uh, I spoke to videos. a couple of let me, let me get there. We have. Oh, okay. We, okay. We have. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sorry. Okay. Let me just say, and thank you, Ms. Moon. We, okay. we, we're familiar with the program. We've been working uh, to get some funds. We couldn't give any funds out because of the 5013C status. But yes, sir. Mr. Cobb and, program, uh, and the uh, Gun Violence Prevention Program had some ideas, and he's been working with it. So I'll go to him and just share with us. What's, what's the status of it now? Well, Latori, thank you for, for coming back. Thank you. Uh, giving us an update. You guys, you guys are amazing and innovative. Uh, you took it to the park. And um, you're, you're showing that the importance of this uh, wherever you can be. Uh, yeah. And the kids are responding and the families are responding. Um, <clears throat> we were disappointed that we couldn't do a grant because um, nonprofit status wasn't there but I understand that several people from the community worked with you yes, the yes, small sir. business development center worked with you to get that 501c3 nonprofit status in a very quick manner and yes, so I commend you for that work because that's not easy you have to establish a board of directors you have to make sure you have a dedicated account for that um, all, and all of the IRS approval so you've done that and we commend you for that and I, what, what I wanted to recommend to you was, I know the <clears throat> original proposal that you submitted may or may not be what you'd like to resubmit. Okay. So if you just want to get that to the commission, um, we can work with you to review that um, and hopefully get some funding your way. Um, Thank you. To help you, to help support your program. Is there any other questions? Uh, no, I, and I will just add, you know, I've been talking to you, uh, you know, every other week or so yes. trying to make sure we're on track. Yes. But I will say that the, our city manager is not here, but he, remember he talked about a backup venue for you. Okay. So I'll try to get an update for you um, and then um, share that with you because uh, Mr. Cowell is out of town right now. But I do know he had a couple places in mind. Uh, and, and Mr. Greer, do you have an update for him? Yes, uh, he did mention Norwich may still be a okay. possibility, okay. and uh, we'll be reaching out with you after the meeting Thank to uh, work with you and try to get you some net eligible nonprofit <laughs> funding that we have and any other resources that we have also. Much appreciated, sir. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, thank, thank you all. Madam Clerk. Okay, we have, I'll do the next three. That is Whitney Hayes, Lindsay Lineberry, and Charles Jones. Whitney, Whitney Hayes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Whitney Hayes. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm here to talk about the importance of reproductive rights. I was very lucky growing up. My dad was a family physician in my county and had seen his fair share of teen pregnancies. I got the safe sex talk not once, but twice. In, in short, I was properly educated from a young age on how contraception works. I used these lessons as a teenager and into adulthood. But make no mistake, even with sex education on my side, accidents can happen and did. I don't mind telling you that I purchased the Plan B several times throughout my life. And while I have never experienced a pregnancy, if I had, I would not have hesitated to seek an abortion. Parenting, as I have witnessed it, is the hardest job in the world. The financial, mental, and physical toll it takes on parents, particularly the birthing parent, is not something to take lightly, no matter how rewarding children might be. Especially in the first few years before children can attend school, parenting is a consuming role. While it is not a lifestyle I choose for myself, I believe it is one that people should have full agency to choose or not choose for themselves. The demanding task of parenting is likely why six in 10 women who seek abortion in the US are already mothers, according to data from the CDC. And about half of those women have two or more children. People want to be good parents to the children they already have. They deserve the legal protections to make this choice for themselves should an accidental pregnancy occur. Becoming a parent is not just an issue of bodily autonomy, but it is one of financial autonomy. Child rearing is incredibly expensive and with inflation is at an all time high. Even before parents, parents bring their babies home, they will be charged an average of nearly $23,000 for birthing procedures, which is more than three times what was charged in 20, or sorry, 2000, according to Department of Health and Human Services data. It is also estimated that it costs parents around 17,000 a year for one child. That is just over 300,000 for a child up until they are 18 years old. That is why it may come as no surprise that nearly half of the people seeking abortions are considered to be below, are considered below the poverty level. So while an unintended and forced pregnancy could be a challenge to someone like me who works for a nonprofit, it could be devastating to others in our community without the necessary resources. What I'm asking for from my city council is the willingness to put forward a resolution that supports legal access to reproductive health care, which includes abortions. Abortion is health care. Abortion is autonomy, and our citizens here in Roanoke deserve this autonomy to make the decisions that are right for them. Thank you very much for your time. Lindsay Leinberger. Leinberry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens. Council members, mayor, vice mayor, my name is Lindsay Lineberry. I'm with the Roanoke Alliance for Reproductive Rights. My pronouns are she, her. I'm an educator, a mother, and a taxpaying citizen of this wonderful city. In 2015, I suffered a miscarriage with my first pregnancy. It was scary, traumatic, discouraging, isolating, and it was one of the most difficult times of my life. A pregnancy that I had chosen had not gone as planned, and I was completely taken by surprise at how easy it was to lose something I'd wanted so badly. In some states, laws are criminalizing birthing persons for having miscarriages. I cannot fathom suffering a loss and then being punished further for that loss. After I took some time to recover and heal, my husband and I became pregnant for a second time. We were afraid to feel joy and celebrate this pregnancy due to our previous loss, but after a successful pregnancy, I birthed our first child. But shortly after his arrival, I was rushed to the emergency room for a life-saving procedure, a procedure that without doctors being able to quickly make the decision to perform, 
I would have not survived to mother my son, nor would I have had the chance to bring another life into this world. A procedure that given the strict laws other states in this country are facing would be questioned and possibly outlawed due to the fact that this procedure is also used to perform abortions. I lost a liter and a half of blood in the short amount of time that they had to get me under and begin this procedure. In my case, there would be no time to discuss with lawyers whether this procedure was allowed or not. I would have died had they waited any longer. In my 35 years, the only thing I know for sure is life is not easy and that things are never black and white. And to have lawmakers paid by citizens like myself feel emboldened to make decisions regarding my body and my life is infuriating, to say the least. Without bodily autonomy, we are not free. Given the support, our governor would make these decisions to restrict reproductive rights, and he, was, he has already voiced the desire to, to do so. I'm here to implore you as my elected city council members to go on record that you support your constituents and their freedom to choose, just like in Alexandria, Richmond, and Blacksburg. I would never wish the difficult task of parenting on anyone who is not ready or willing. I am here for the birthing person who does not want to have children. I am here for the birthing person who is raped and does not want to bring a life into this world via trauma. I am here for the birthing person who says they are adamantly pro-life but does not realize that they too will need these options when their pregnancy does not go as planned. I am here for the at-risk person who fears for their life and their unborn child will be chosen over their own when they seek emergency care. I'm here for the parent who already has children and the thought of the physical, emotional, mental, and financial toll of having another is heavier than the thought of terminating a pregnancy. Empathy, understanding, and caring, that is all that is needed to, under, to know that when it comes to reproductive health care, things are never black and white. Please take a stand for us to protect abortion access and reproductive health care in Virginia. Thank you. The next speaker is Charles Jones. Okay, we'll move on. Um, Luke Pretty, Teresa Walker, Teresa Gill Walker, and Chris Kraft. Mayor Lee, members of council, I have prepared remarks um, on behalf of someone else that I'm going to say in a moment, but um, I'm just glad to be here tonight, to, to feel the energy that's in the room. Uh, seeing a developer who reaches out to the neighborhood before they even start planning, to see the way that our parks are being utilized, uh, to just hear all the applause for what people are doing. There's such great energy. I kind of wish every council meeting can be like this, and I, I hope most of you feel that way too, because I know all of them are. But I have a, uh, remarks on behalf of someone else that I'd like to provide tonight who couldn't be here. Uh, this statement was provided by a Roanoke citizen who couldn't be here tonight. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my experiences. I would have preferred to speak on my own behalf, but I am grateful that someone else could be my voice. My personal experiences with fertility treatment and a pregnancy with complications have emphasized to me how the right to an abortion is essential health care. After three years of experiencing infertility, we gave birth to our first daughter through in vitro fertilization, IVF. The process involves developing the embryos outside of the body and placing them into a uterus at a later date. IVF came into the existence about 10 years after the Roe v. Wade ruling. Now that abortion restrictions are cropping up across the nation, fertility patients are being directly impacted. When rulings dictate that life begins at conception, there will be questions about what we can and can't do with the embryos our genetic material has created. For instance, can we freeze our embryos? Can we get our embryos genetically tested to minimize the risk of miscarriage? Will the state force us to use all of our embryos? Fearful of the direction Virginia is trending, my husband and I, in consultation with our doctors, have had to move forward with another round of IVF to ensure we have the access to our family planning needs in, a case, in case a ban is put in place. That is where I am and where I was today, beginning the next stages of growing our family. Having recently given birth to our first daughter in a high-risk pregnancy, I am also keenly aware of the unique dangers that come with birth. I had a number of complications that could have resulted in severe impairment of death of both my daughter and myself. There are so many stages in the process where it could have gone wrong. 
Even now, my risk of experiencing these complications again is fairly high as we begin to grow our family. I am genuinely scared about what it might mean to be pregnant with complications in Virginia without access to abortion care. Even an exception for a mother's life does not ease my fears. These restrictions place doctors in the unimaginable position of deciding between saving their patients' lives or losing their profession and livelihood. And that is why I strongly encourage the City Council to adopt a legislative agenda that supports access to abortion care for all and demonstrates to us as your citizens that you support us in deciding when, if, and how our families will grow. Thank you. Teresa Gill Walker. Good morning, Ma good evening, Mayor Lee and City Council members. Mm -hmm. I'm here today to talk about the Evans Spring Project, which I thought I would never have to discuss again. I do understand that this is something that some people have a lot of passion about to the point that they're saying, oh, this is their land, they should be able to do what they want to do with it. And I completely agree with that. But our land in Melrose Rugby, Fairland, and Villa Heights, we want to be able to do what we want to do with it, and we don't want it disrupted by industrial bu building. We have been in this neighborhood for generations. We have elders who are on fixed incomes, their homes are paid for. We have young people who have moved into the community because it is something that is affordable for them and now you hear the children laughing and playing all over the place. And when we talk about our land, 30 acres of that belongs to the city of Roanoke, which we are the citizens who are paying the taxes and doing the voting, so we should have some say so about those 30 acres. Now, I want you to understand that I Googled and Googled, and Googled. But from 2002 until June 7th, 2022, there was nothing mentioned about Evan Springs. And I have to say, the only reason it got mentioned is because a resident came forth and talked about it. If they had not talked about it, when were you going to notify us that our homes were going to be put at risk, that our neighbors our neighborhood, the integrity of our neighborhood was going to be put at risk. I mean, these are things that as our elected officials who are here to take care of us as citizens and to look out for the city of Roanoke, that you guys should be doing. We love Roanoke. I love Roanoke. And all of us love Roanoke. We don't want to leave, we want to protect it. We want to make it better. I mean, we've got these terrific artists that are right here, out here in the hallway showing how dynamic and diverse we are as a community. We are as a city, and we want to keep it that way. We don't have a problem with you developing the 100 acres that belongs to them. Just don't disrupt our neighborhoods while you're doing it. That is the one thing that we do not want to see done. And I don't understand why this keeps coming back again and again and again. And just to say this, Roanoke City has been an all-American city seven times. And if you think that the integrity of our neighborhoods didn't make a large contribution to that, then you're wrong. Because it did. So I'm asking you to continue to look out for your citizens as well as the city but look out for our neighborhoods. So maybe we can become All-American City again because our neighborhoods will be maintained. This is a neighborhood, Melrose Rugby, Villa Heights, Fairland, that we want to maintain and keep, not get disrupted. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Chris Kraft. Good evening again. Um, I'll make it brief because I know y'all been here most of the day. First of all, I'd like for all of y'all to reach in and get out your calendars. Saturday, October 15th from 1 to 4, Thrasher Park, we will have a Hispanic Heritage Month health fair. We'll have over 15 health organizations, food, gift card raffles, 
This is to show our Hispanic neighbors in the neighborhood and the whole city of Roanoke what is available for them. Half of them on Eastern Avenue right there at Thrasher Park have no idea what's available in our city. They call the city, they don't know who to speak to to get an interpreter when they call for different things. So we'd love to have y'all come out. Ms. Sanchez, Sanchez Jones has graciously helped the Wildwood Civic League organize this, and I thank you. On another note, I'd like to thank, um, ask the assistant city manager if he would give Mr. Cowell my apology, because at the last meeting when I called a department manager and his people minions, I was saying it nicely, but he took it the wrong way. When I was talking about the Mason's Mill Greenway detour, I talked to Michael Clark of Parks and Rec, and he said he sees no reason there was even a detour put, because people come off 460 at 20th Street, go down, go over Mason's Mill, back to 13th Street and Holland's Road. How come he didn't just make the thing, uh, detour straight down Orange Avenue and tell him to turn at 13th Street instead of speeding down through a neighborhood where kids play in the street? Luke Pugh, he's a nice guy, but I don't know who did the planning on that, but they dropped the ball. They don't care about the citizens in the neighborhoods. They just care about what they need to do. And the second thing is there's several departments that me and another couple other neighborhood associations have tried to reach. Streets. Um, what is it? Urban forestry. We call them about problems. We never get any phone calls back. You come down to the bottom of Eastgate Avenue and you try to turn left at traffic coming from Orange to going to Mason's Mill. The weeds are up this tall. You have to put your front end into 13th Street to see to go, to go that way, traffic coming this way. I have called for the past two summers for the city to come and keep it clean. Nobody will answer the phone calls. School buses can't see over the high weeds coming down the hill. <coughs> if I'm coming down that hill and there's a truck coming down, tractor trailer coming down 13th Street and hits me, who's going to be liable? The city? Because there's no public, what do you call it, right away where you can see. But nobody seems to answer phone calls. I've left 16 messages since April with the streets department. Not one return phone call. That's pathetic. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Chris, October 15, what was the times again? One to four. One to four, Thrasher Park, right? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. All right, next speaker. And this is our last speaker, Frida Cathcart. Um, I, might, I appreciate this time to address the council, Mayor Lee. Um, I would wanted to follow up. Obviously, I was very angry the last time I was here. I get really angry when I think that children's health and welfare is in, in danger. And they are, especially when I think that there might be stuff that I can do as well as the city to respond to it. And just wondering the best ways to do that. Um, since I spoke here the last time, I got some feedback that the city doesn't need to worry about the surplus building in Fishburn Park that is peeling lead paint and has rotten boards because of sovereign immunity. Well, I wanted to clear this up. As I mentioned before, I used to be a claims um, specialist working for a reinsurance company that processed um, claims that had to do with localities. And sovereign immunity does not... Um, protect, well, the immunity mostly protects acts of simple negligence by governmental employee, but does not protect against gross negligence, willful or want, and wanton or intentional wrongs. So when you have a citizen tell you that you have a building that's in your ownership, that's peeling lead paint, that's open to the public, and has rotten boards on it, then you all need to take action. At the very, very least, put a sign on the building telling people 
that there's danger and to stay away from the building. That's not that hard to do. I could whip one up and stick one up there. So that's something that can be done. But there's been several capital improvements, maintenance things that have happened in the park where we have not been consulted as a neighborhood as far as what are our priorities. And I can tell you in our neighborhood, as well as in many neighborhoods in Roanoke, the public safety is our top priority. Yes, we like to have fun. We love the beauty of the park. But we also need to make sure that it's maintained and there's public safety. There's lead Roanoke that can help um, potentially get grants and funds. Um, I hope that the city takes it from being a surplus building and brings it into parks and recreation and works with our neighborhood to fix it up. But for goodness sakes, for our children's sakes, for the well-being of our city and the people that come to it, fix the peeling lead paint and the rotten boards so that nobody gets hurt. I also wanted to talk to you about a basic principle when it comes to water, when it comes to Evans Springs, because I heard that y'all are having a consultant look at where the water could go. Water is susceptible to gravity and it flows downhill. It's that simple. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Bespin. Madam Clerk, that was the last speaker that signed up. Yes. I, I just wanted to say, uh, make sure that folks out there know, uh, Mr. Mayor, that you asked me to uh, chair the legislative committee again this year. If you have comments about uh, reproductive health care being accessible, please put them in an email and email them to clerk at roanokeva.gov. That does two things. One, it allows her to forward it to the seven of us, and secondly, it puts it in the record for the city. Okay, so, you know, I'd say send emails to me, but I don't keep the records. Ms. McCoy keeps the records. So please send any comments that you may have. This will be a topic for a discussion on our next legislative committee meeting, which is October 6th. That's a Thursday. Uh, a departure from our usual practice of meeting on the first Monday because the VML conference is the first part of that week, so it's Thursday the 6th. We don't take public comments or, or questions or anything at that time because we're working on our committee work. So please get those to the clerk in advance of October 16th, uh, excuse me, October 6th, if at all possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, Ms. Vice Mayor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just need some clarification um, as it relates to Evan Springs. I don't, you know, I won't get into a debate because I know we're only at the consulting phases, but I've heard a couple people say there's 30 acres, but according to my notes, the city only owns 4.5, which is the Tension Basin. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Greer? That it says, somebody said 30 acres. Uh, everything I've, uh, that I've seen says 4.5, which is the Detention Basin. Yes, and they keep referencing the part of it is the neighborhood that's 28 acres, and I think they were referencing their particular neighborhood. Oh, okay, so it wasn't that the city owned? No. Okay, I just no. wanted to make sure that the city did not own 30 acres. Right. Okay, thank you. And I well, I'm glad you brought that point. We got to make that clear yeah. that the city didn't own, doesn't own that. No, it's only four and a half acres, uh, which is the detention basin. Well, see, that was one of the things I'm concerned about with this. And first of all, as elected officials, we have to be careful in terms of discussing issues and things that, that really that's not before us. Ultimately, it would will be when it comes down to that, but we've got to be very guarded on our discussions on that. Because it's not, uh, right now, we're not moving to do anything. This council is not moving to do anything on, on, on Evans Spring. And so I think that's important for everybody to know. Uh, and so, again, numbers go back and forth. People saying 30 acres or people saying 
the 15 acres and it's going back and forth. That will be, when the time comes, that will be made known clear to everybody what that is. But our job as elected officials, because apparently at, at some point there could be something we would have to do on, and again, the law prohibits us from doing certain things and how we do as elected officials, not as just citizen John Smith, but elected official who are appointed to eventually make a decision on certain things as it goes through the process. So um, I don't know about anybody else on this council, but it's nothing we're hiding from anything. Matter of fact, uh, uh, we're making some decisions on a lot of other things, but Evan Springs is not far enough in terms of terms of where we are. Uh, is not something that we're out discussing with the discussing at all at this point in time. All right, is there any other questions? Anything else in the council has to I say? I just have an announcement, Mayor, at the end. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you, this is just an announcement. I've gotten a, uh, a flyer from a friend of mine, Marvin Fields Jr., about a, a youth workshop. And if I could just read it, Mayor, this is uh, pertaining to the youth and something that might benefit them. But on Monday, the 26th of September at five o'clock, Field of Hopes and Dreams would like to announce they're collaborating with Stephen Weeby Jefferson to come and speak to the youth in the community. Um, they're excited about it because Stephen has uh, come to talk to the youth. Um, he is a uh, clinical associate uh, in the operating room at Carulian, but he has a long history and he has a lot of information that he can share with the youth because uh, his past uh, hasn't always been on the straight and narrow, and he's done a lot of uh, things, and he's experienced a lot, and he wants to share that with the youth. So if you have a young young person that would uh, be interested, um, you can attend that at Faith and Hope Church in Roanoke at 1802 Orange Avenue. And again, this is on Monday, September the 26th at 5 o'clock to hear Stephen Weeby Jefferson. I think uh, a lot of people call him Weeby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right, if there being no further business to come before the council, the council meeting is declared in recess until Thursday, September 29th, 2022, at 8.30 a.m. in the city council chamber, to which will include a tour of area capital projects and then reconvene at the Bergman Center for the remainder of the day. And on Friday, September 30th, 2022, at 8.30 a.m., convene at the Hotel Roanoke and Conference Center at 110 Shenandoah Avenue Northeast for a City Council Strategic Planning Retreat. So that's our schedule for the next week. And uh, there being no further business, we'll call this meeting in recess. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor.